Um, I was speaking yesterday at the after the MFA talk, which was so much fun, um, about how um, I had submitted what like a former version of this manuscript that became my book to a poetry contest for poetry about the nuclear bomb. It was called the Test Site Poetry Contest. It was for books of poems about the atomic bomb. And I was not even a finalist. I like, didn't even get a like response. You know, I think I got a submittable, like, thank you for submitting. Um, and like, that was it. And then later, the contest winners were um, announced, and I was pissed. <laughs> but that needed to happen, right? And one of the reasons why that needed to happen was because um, like my ego had gotten involved, and I couldn't really see clearly what I was working on. Um, Bojan has a line in his story that's like the leather mask of progress, and that shit is hard to peel off. <laughs> and I grew up in that, right? Um, I grew up like doused in that daily. Oh, and now I'm all of a sudden like, I'm just feeling it, you guys. I feel like I've been haunting my former self as we walk <laughs> around campus and seeing all these beautiful faces. That means so much to me, anyway. Okay. Um, so, anyways, my point of bringing that up is that. Uh, after that meltdown, I went on a long walk through the woods and I wrote what became the first poem of this book. Um, and I feel like it was maybe the first poem where I started to have the deeper reckoning with myself that I had to have, um, even though it was like highly uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'll start there. <clears throat> but think, are you authorized to tell it? I didn't know the secret we kept when we lived in the town where quiet vines thread trees in winter. Now I visit every year to see the trumpet creeper gone brown and the kudzu like dead party streamers. And today there was a squirrel eyeing me from his side the way a squirrel must. He clattered on the roof and called for me to speak more plainly. So I'll shoot for pared down, a small phrase to hold and turn over, a coin with two sides, cool and smooth and seductive like security. You could bite the coin to test the secret, or lay an eye on it as you sleep, just for the quality of the image. Electrons dance inside metal like dreams. Walking deep through Greenway Trail, I listen to the story of Tsutomu, who made it home from Nagasaki to Hiroshima after one white flare, in time to see the second. And then I sit on a root shiny with sap from a higher wound, tooth down on what I meant to share with you. The hard coin whirs against my tongue. I don't believe I've ever been quiet just because I was told. Um, and the title of that poem is, was taken from um, some wartime propaganda billboard that was famously photographed in Oak Ridge. And also, you did such a great job giving context of this weird prophet that I became obsessed with, um, who I discovered, <laughs> who I rediscovered his story during my MFA time. So I think I'll, I'll read the, um, the initial poem that I had written um, for him. His name is John Hendricks, and yeah, he supposedly foresaw all of this. Um, but then, of course, his story was hijacked because um, prophecy is powerful. The idea of prophecy is. <clears throat> Prophecy after heartbreak. She left me and I missed being touched. That's the reason I went barefoot through the woods. Barefeet give one the sense of being intimate. The dirt tickled me and a speck of oak lodged between my toes. And then I saw two streams run out in opposite directions, though they laid beside each other. This struck me, called to me like my long gone wife. Listen here, the stream said really loudly. <laughs> Listen better. If I say, God, how the earth of her would shake, you figure I'm prone to exaggerate. But you're imagining our love now, which is good. It's what people forget. You can call love God if you like. I lay down because I missed her and because desire is a kind of God. We all know that. When the ground kept whispering, I pressed an ear down. And of course I called it God. By now you know that men around these parts will do that. Hear a woman's breath from deep within and say it's godlike. That's the point, John. Listen better. I listened so long I got hungry, like when we used to lie all day in bed. And in that state, I dreamed, listening, listening. I could hear what was brewing here as if the seed of disease, the sound both strange and close to home. 
as my belly rumbles in a fight. And in the rumbling, I heard, yes, the pounding down of railroad ties. Yes, the rushed up factories for the bomb. And I think I had a word for bomb. How they'd enlist all this I've said as platform for their story. Well, here John saw the atom split, and here John spoke God's plan. But I was trying to say, I hear you. I was trying to say, come back home. And then there's a poem I will never read in public because a daughter dies in it, and now I have a daughter, so I'm going to skip that one. I have a couple of Phoenix poems, so I'm going to try to find them. OK, so this poem is set in Valley Bar um, in downtown. I'm sure you guys know it. <laughs> have fun. Um, we were at a, a King Dude concert there, and so this is an epigraph from one of their songs. More God stuff, too. It's a, it's a baggage I have. If God up above wants you so dumb, what kind of devil does that make him? <clears throat> and it's called The General. My body is loose with a bad Tennessee whiskey, and B, Moody, and I are all lulling our heads to a song that, along with the whiskey, makes my grandmother pray for us from her grave. I'm thinking of my first love, how he'd cut my body on my star felt sheets and tell me all he wanted to do was sleep. When he left me for a military academy, I threw a lamp across the room to scare myself back into the body he loved. He's probably a general now, I slur. Then learn he trains people how to kill people for a living because Moody Googles him right there at the bar. Has me spell the name correctly till I repeat the letter K like a mantra. Feel a fiber jolt through me that I'd like to tell you was an echo of love, but was really a grief all for me. An ache for the girl standing in her room, holding her arm out for the light she'd just thrown. <sighs> this one is called Grapefruit Tree. Um, there are like some faces that I'm so happy to see, and there are some that are no longer with us. And this is for Naira, and I'm going to try really hard not to cry when I read it. Um, to try not to cry, I'm going to imagine that she's rolling her eyes at me, which like she probably is doing somewhere. <laughs> um, for Naira, we want to use the word bloom. Even a pitcher plant, phallic in glory, blooms. We want to see the petals pushing out. And since we have no deal with time, we stupidly unfurl our mouths. Nouns that have been said to. Onion, algae, mushroom cloud, daughter, cancer. This last because we like to trick ourselves into a vast perspective, one that slides more easily into absence. Today, the trick has failed me. What does it say about us that even knowing what we know of matter, we still see ourselves as whole, steady? At 5 AM, sweet pollen glides into my room. How beautiful the word citrus. How eager I am to write it down. The citrus trees are blooming right now, by the way. You guys notice? The smell is like so luscious. I mean, it makes me sneeze, but it's so beautiful. Um, and like not having grown up around here, it's, it's like a, it's a marker of this place in a way that I don't have a lot of other natural connections, but that's, that's one of them. I think I'll read this weird poem, Appraisal Report, since you spoke about it so beautifully. Um, it's such a weird poem, um, but I, I'm a fan of it. <laughs> I'm a fan of my work. I want to read it. <laughs> Um, but the photo is really cool. You, you should Google it after the reading, or you know, right now. I don't care. Um, it's the the po the photograph is single atom in an ion trap, and it's by David Nadlinger, who I like really tried to get in touch with, and he really just did not care um, that a poet was interested in writing a poem about his photograph. But he managed to catch via like some laser contraption um, a single atom and took a photo of it with a very I don't know how he did it. I'm supposed to know, but. Magically, he accomplished this. And it's just like a little pinprick of light. Um, but it's beautiful, and it's weird to think that you're, you're able to see it isolated. Um, and it does all weird things to your brain. So that's what this is about. Emitting just the right blue-violet light. Not this blue. Not this violet. Not this blue. Not this violet. 
blue and violet like irradiated want, like Taco Bell, like fat and acid sliding down my throat. I catch on motionless on what I bulge up and pull, everything the sea is not. Motionless pricks, motionless is rigid clamp, is out of time. I buoy my worry like a cross stitch set against velour. Cross stitch blue as the houses of my hormones, peptide honeycombs, pristine chambers, complicated trash put out back. Speck better than the purple squish consolidating at the nave of the toilet. Speck of endless voraciousness to make, to have. Speck that urges me to say multitudinous, the word in my mouth nearly motionless, nearly seen. Speck almost what I want it to be, the image from a song we once sang. Particle man, particle man. <laughs> Do you guys know that song? Good, okay. Now it's gonna be in your head all night. The idea of scope spreading in, the, in my nine-year-old brain like mold, like rot on a banana. I wish I had some, I mean, that's like weird. I'm, it's not necessarily funny. Like, do I have any funny? I have, a, I have a poem with a joke in it, but I don't think it's funny. <laughs> um, So um, scattered throughout the book are several poems written um, that the, their title, it was an originally a series, but they, now they're kind of sprinkled throughout. And the titles all came from the name of an area that I found of an early like sketch, an early like concept sketch. It's not the right word of a military document, but that's what it was, an early concept sketch of the lab um, uh, in Oak Ridge, of one of the labs in Oak Ridge. And this one is called Deploying. Like I'm like, what did they do in the area called Deploying? They think about deploying. Did they like? They didn't practice. They didn't. Anyway, who knows? So that really caught on to my. Um, that really worried me. <laughs> deploying. Every use becomes a metaphor for using. Every metaphor for using becomes a reason for using. A link in the chain that has evolved into a chain of pure thought. A chain that fattens or shrinks as a thought may fatten or shrink in any given moment untouched as it goes in the grove of the mind. <clears throat> Each tree makes way for the next while managing to feed itself fully on the light. Wait, are, were we speaking of metal or of wood? Am I lost? The goal, after all, the word Manhattan is a woman wishing so much for affection that no one will give her any. And for added irony, the general's home address. Reorient. As he would say, recast necessary but unsavory violations of logic. Not see what is possible, but see what is possible through. Seen through, his language environments have grown greedy, speak nuclear heritage, define bomb as birthright. Ask, was your grandfather in the war? Does your dad work at the lab? Why are you writing about this again? You'd be amazed how many people from my hometown were like, wait, why are you writing about a grid? It's so boring. Like, what, what, what has ever gone on here? Like, you guys are eating a burger named Little Boy. Like, <laughs> it's, it's real. It's at the other one cafe. <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see here. I am... Trying to find, yes, okay. I'll, I'll read one more poem from the book. Um, and I, I hope that it sheds light into how I started thinking about home and where I'm from and this legacy or birthright or whatever you want to call it in a way that doesn't sound like a fantastic thing. Um, how I started thinking about it differently after moving here and living here and being here and getting to know um, the history here. So this is called Song for a Hometown Prophet, Years After Moving Away. And it's the same John. Um, I wish I had a picture of him. Um, he was like really wiry looking and I'd love for you to have his face just like stamped in your vision. So maybe, maybe this poem will do that. 
And what John saw after he laid his face to the ground as he'd been asked by the voice that had come to him, what he saw was invasive, like the charred smell rising through Bee's home in the Phoenix pre-dawn blue. Seeing how the war would come must have intruded on John's senses, as smoke against the usual desert clear now intrudes on mine, has triggered me awake. What John saw as he slept must have triggered him. I can see how after his 40 days of dreaming, he must have stood abruptly, dripping with the Appalachian dirt. And what was coursing through John when he woke was as real as the color of his daughter's skin, blue when diphtheria killed her. And that he could see the coming factory, where they would do the work to make the earth shake, that he could see was as natural as smelling a brush fire. Burnt oleander is natural oleander after all, and smells weirdly sweet, turned, green, turned neon as it entered my dreams. This flare is my periphery now as I lie awake. It's made all reds go pink. Beside our bed, a, a plastic glass now loud with color the Navajo blanket as if pulsing at my feet, and threaded in it, clear as the purpose that built the city where I was born, the thought of Bee's sister, how her eyes were bright from crying as she spoke of the mines on the Navajo Nation, about some 500 contaminated buildings there, how their mother played as a child in that dust, how against such glare, the black outlines of ourselves glow harder, how what was coursing through John when he woke must have felt like an even hotter, even hotter burning on his tongue. Each day of 40, a cluster of uranium burst from the buds as if he'd licked the same Arizona dust. For as John slept, I see it was a rebound of the element, feeding back and shimmying up through the Tennessee Ridge, coursing through the place where they'd bring what was mined. That's what touched his lips. And on his eyelids, shut against the ground, it was the soft shine from a bomb that years away had already fallen. What John saw when he woke through his white wire hair, when he saw was imprinted with this shine. It fixed his vision as if into a magic eye so that his loneliness first pixelated, then popped together. Quick, the way only loneliness or fear of it can. All right, I'm like trying to get a gauge of how we're feeling with all this nuclear bomb talk. <laughs> um, so I think maybe a love poem, a little shift. Um, I have to read my, this, this one of my most recent poems and it's a love poem for my husband and since we're like on this show together, I have to read it for you. Um, plus I think it's, it speaks to the way our writing lives are kind of intertwined in a beautiful way. Um, we've stopped like fighting about poems these days. <laughs> Those fights were epic. I, think we, I just like wait a little while before I give you a draft. Or you wait to tell me what you think is wrong. <laughs> That's probably more likely. So, love poem. In your poems, I'm a triad steeping in sunless room. Or, I am not me, but your ex a woman I've never met and who bears you no grudge, who left you again and again and still somehow she's here in my poem, a jeweled pen of a promise, a ruby gifted by the Tsarina, a snow-blown character in a novel about deep woods and a tree that rooted around in my darkness the winter I read it. In your poems, I am never the first light of morning pressing through our eastern window, and though I can admit to wanting to be, the tension here isn't what readers might believe. In your poems, the eucalyptus branches are being cleared. You're still clearing them, still digging your O's around the trunks, waiting for water. I want to see the golden flicker of the leaves, a trick that comes with the older sun of afternoon. But in your poems, your, mirac your miraculous images make way for me that is always just beyond what I want. In your poem, I would be the one who watched you split the pumpkins with a hatchet and throw them over the wall. At dusk, you wait to hear our herd of javelinas squelch the gooey sweetness. And almost smiling, you bring me here and ask, did you hear that? I did. How dear to me that wet snout sound of a mother having led her body through the brambles, feeding, knowing it could show up any day now in one of our poems. 
sometimes I feel like when something really poetic and beautiful happens, I'm like, who's going to write the poem first? <laughs> like, I hope it's me. <laughs> Do you ever feel like that? <laughs> Admission. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to read maybe two more um, shorter new poems. Um, I'm like, okay, there's a baby skull. There's, <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> this is all kind of grim. <sighs> I have a real, oh, okay, I know what I'll do. Okay, I'll read one, um, yeah, I'll read one of these. Postpartum psychology, which is not uplifting, but then I'll, I'll move on to something else that will hopefully be brighter. I don't know why I always feel like reading poems, you have to find a balance of dark and light. Like, it's all dark. <laughs> Just, you know. Um, but when you're up on stage, it begins to, begins to wear. It begins to hang heavy. Postpartum psychology. The nurses knew what to do with an infant. They eddied around us in mission linen, while I, a stupid succulent, tried to absorb their intuition. Then the nurses brought me sleep, taking my daughter to be cleaned. A landscape of horror reeled, all primordial shit, a fox decaying on time-lapse repeat, fungi spreading like infection, making it impossible for me to breathe. I couldn't stop the show and somehow knew it wasn't one. What the nurse's training taught. How easily we stroll through our days, forgetting. Forgetting is easy. What is a sonnet? I remember when I wrote a 12 lines on it in Cynthia Hoke's class. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Forgetting is easy. What is a sonnet? How many lines? How many days spent defending your thesis? What kind of rhyme? What texture were your dreams back then? And what other forms have dissolved since? I do remember the stale Catalinas, what static was framed by the waiting room windows. The room gleaned monochrome and the mountains persisted, both harsh in their whispers. You end here if she does. I'm gone already, I thought, afraid to hope she'd continue to be. I can't help tasting that word they had me sign, emergency. Couldn't then help but see the smaller room they brought us to as a pod used to insulate grief. But then the surgeon sighed, showing us her box of mysteries. The closed box her surgeon held out like a treat, as if to show us what we did not see. A rib retractor, total opening, three inches. Baby mixture scissors. Scalpels specialized in bringing her to strawberry hearts. My daughter's stomach a fig, her diaphragm chrysalis thin. Today my daughter digs for rock she needs in a recipe of her own invention. And she turns when I yell, surprised by the bluish knobs growing from a tree I thought I wasted water on. Figs, I say, because figs. Unripe and unsweet, but figs, real figs, newly visible on the leafless spines. In two weeks, we plan to move, so I tear some off, take them into open, just to see. I think I have another poem that's a prose poem. Am I good on time? Like maybe five more minutes? Yeah? I'm going to read a prose poem because I famously got into an argument during my MFA that prose poetry was not poetry. And now I have to eat my own words. <laughs> um, actually, when I was going through my notes trying to come up with some quotes from Norman, which I will end this with because that's what I want to do, um, I, I saw a quotation from one of my workshops with him where he was like, writing, an, writing a prose poem is like writing with an invisible net, and writing in lineation is writing with like a net that you can see. So it's not like the net isn't there. He just it's you still have to you still have to miss the net. I'm like, did I hit it, Norman? Did I did I fail that tennis lesson? Internal vacancies. At the picnic, my family's dreams take out their sit-upons and watch a passenger plane mark the sky. They calm down long enough for me to crouch among them, thinking I know things. Why do you want a truck that both works? and needs to be worked on, cousin? It's a leading question. And isn't your mother's real wish to be able to distinguish between the crackers and the cheese? Presently, she's laughing at her puzzle. We're all remembering how we once crowned her the Vogel Queen, and now this unquieted laughter may be the only way she knows how to breathe. Funny how they have no essential existence, our dreams, yet here they sit, keeping their would-be rear ends clean. 
I understand why the multiverse is in vogue again, unfolding its potential on at least three pixelated screens sealed twice from sky, from the clouds above us heavy with their real water. I can say it so easily, which world I see us each wanting to open. The widow wears white and drinks sweet tea. In the yard, we hear our futures rustling. And so, like, I thought I would end the night. Um, definitely the stellar part, <laughs> but I think any of these poems would not have existed had I not been so lucky to have the teachers that I've had. Um, you know, I just feel an immense amount of gratitude for you all. And um, I've been thinking a lot about Norman Duby lately, who I know we all miss. Um, and I, I wanted to find like the perfect Norman anecdote to share with you and end. Um, but instead, I think I'll just read a poem and then also leave you with this quotation from an, an earlier workshop. You can't be a fucking genius at something and get away with it for free. The gods always come back for you. Um, this is a poem um, that has sort of rattled around in my brain. So when I was trying to think of a poem that I could easily bring, this, this is the one that rose to the surface. And it's probably because of my obsession with physics and, and time. So, An Annual of the Dark Physics by Norman Duby. The Baltic Sea froze in 1307. Birds flew north from the Mediterranean in early January. There were meteor storms throughout Europe. On the first day of Lent, two children took their own lives. Their bodies were sewn into goat skins and were dragged by the hangman's horse the three miles down to the sea. They were given a simple grave in the sand. The following Sunday, Meister Eckhart shouted that a secret, would, a secret word had been spoken to him. He preached that Mary Magdalene sought a dead man in the tomb, but in her confusion found only two angels laughing. This was a consequence of her purity and her all too human grief. The Baltic Sea also froze in 1303. Nothing happened that was worthy of poetry.